Welcome to part two of three, looking at chapter one, an introduction to biology. In this section, we're gonna look at how organisms are the same, but then also how they are different. So in biology, we say that there's unity and diversity to life. So all organisms are united by an evolutionary past. And in fact, this is actually one of our 12 principles that we looked at in part one of this chapter. So we looked at evolution, kind of how organisms are related to each other. So they have similar characteristics to them. For example, they all use ATP as an energy currency. Um, all organisms are made up of cells. So we have this unity that we see. And then besides the unity, we actually also see that organisms are very, very diverse. So we have diverse forms of life living in very diverse environments. For example, in the pictures here, we have the desert, we have grasslands, we have tropical rainforests. And organisms have adaptations to these different environments. So we're going to look at this unity part first, and then we'll look and see how the diversity plays into the biology. For this unity based on evolutionary relationships, we need to look at evolutionary history. Understanding how organisms are related to each other or understanding their evolutionary history, it helps us to really understand the structure and function of an organism's body. So just to remind you from part one, I defined the theory of evolution as the observation that populations of organisms change from one generation to the next generation over time. And this allows organisms to adapt to their environment up here. So just for example, um, in evolution, certain structures, they can be modified to serve new purposes up here. So let's just show you. We have a mammal up at the top of the image, up here, and we're looking at the forelimb, or the arm of the mammal. This structure that is served for walking on land, it's been modified in bats to serve for flight, for example, and then it's also been modified in dolphins, shown here, to become flippers. So these flippers allow the dolphins to move through the water, whereas this theory of evolution, we actually have two mechanisms of evolution we're going to look at. So the first one's called vertical descent with mutation, and then the second type is called horizontal gene transfer. The first type, the vertical descent with mutation, this is looking at how organisms change over time in a lineage. So from the past to the current time. So it goes with time up here. So in the image we have down at the bottom we have millions of years ago and then up towards the top of the image we have what we currently have. So current time at the top. So this is an example showing vertical descent with mutation in horses. So way back, millions of years ago, horses were very, very tiny. They actually live in a forest environment. As that environment changed from being a forest to being more open prairie, like what we have today, these horses, they adapted, they changed over time to become bigger, stronger, they could run faster. And then eventually we end up with a horse that we see the modern day horse we're all familiar with up here. So this vertical descent that happens through time, you first have to have mutations in the population. Those mutations help that organism survive in their environment, either help them to find food, help them to survive. And then if you're more likely to survive, you're more likely to reproduce, so produce offspring. So we have this natural selection that goes on. So organisms that are better able to survive are better able to reproduce and pass on their genes. 
And eventually, if you have a population that adapts to a certain environment, and this population separates from another population, you can end up with two different species that show up. So this is that vertical descent with mutation kind of idea. The second type of evolution, the horizontal gene transfer, this is where it happens at one time, so time doesn't have to change, doesn't have to be millions of years. This is just when we have genetic, ex genetic exchange between different species of organisms. And usually we see this more in bacteria and archaea. So for example here we have these yellow bacteria on the left, such as E. coli, for example. This E. coli, in its chromosomes, in its DNA, it has a gene for antibiotic resistance. And bacteria, the cool thing they can do is they can actually exchange genetic information either within a species or between two different species. So if we take this antibiotic resistance gene and it's transferred to another species on the right, so Streptococcus pneumoniae on the right here, this gene can be incorporated into the chromosome of the strep bacteria. So now our strep bacteria that we have is also resistant to this antibiotic. So this is an example of that horizontal gene transfer. So again, this happens at one time period and it's looking at between different species. All right, so usually if we look at the tree of life, so looking at how organisms are related to each other on the left hand side here, it usually only includes that vertical evolution with mutation. So that we look at what organisms looked like a long time ago and what they look like in modern days at the top of the tree. But now biologists are going more towards kind of this web of life. In the web of life it shows that vertical evolution, that vertical descent with mutation. So you start at the bottom and over time you go up towards the top of the image and that shows how things change through time. In addition, you have these blue horizontal lines. This is that horizontal gene transfer, that second way of evolution right here. So it looks kind of more like a web, a little more complicated as shown in the picture on the right. What we just went through looks at that unity of life. So how things are related through their evolutionary history. So I also mentioned that besides having this unity, we have all of this diversity. So lots and lots of different organisms, lots of different environments that they're adapted to. So the next part of this kind of is looking at that diversity or how we classify all of this diversity. And in classification we have um, part of this called taxonomy. This is where we're going to group species together based on their evolutionary history, but we're going to group like organisms in groups. So kind of the first grouping that we're going to look at is prokaryotic cells shown on the left versus eukaryotic cells shown on the right on your slide. Prokaryotic cells so here we have an example of a prokaryotic cell, it's a bacteria cell. These prokaryotic cells are very, very simple cells and they do not have a nucleus in the middle of them. So they don't have a structure that holds the genetic material. Um, they have a nucleoid region where you find the DNA, but it's not enclosed in any capsule. Whereas if you look at the eukaryotic cells on the right, um, examples we have animal cells and plant cells, eukaryotic cells do have a nucleus. And you can see that the nucleus is labeled in the image, it's the purple circle in the middle. So these eukaryotic cells, they have a nucleus that holds the DNA, that genetic material, 
In addition, they also have other organelles inside the cell. And you can kind of see them, they're the different structures that you see inside, right here. So this is kind of one way we can group organisms into what type of cell they have. Okay, so now we have our two types of cells are actually listed on the right. So we have prokaryotic cells that lack a nucleus. And then down more we have eukaryotic cells. These are cells that have a nucleus and organelles. So in our taxonomy, in classification, we actually have three domains. And these are very, very large groups of organisms. So our first domain is the bacteria domain. And you can see bacteria, they have prokaryotic cells, so those simple cells. The second domain, the archaea, they also have prokaryotic cells, so they also have those simple cells. Bacteria and archaea, they are composed of different types of organisms, and I'll show you examples of these in a little bit. Our third domain is the eukarya domain. Eukarya domain has eukaryotic cells. So just remember eukarya, eukaryotic. And then the eukarya domain is split into four kingdoms. We have protist, plant kingdom, fungi kingdom, and the animalia, or animal kingdom, right here. So we have our three domain system up here, and then the eukarya domain split into four kingdoms. We're going to look at the domain bacteria first, and here's examples of different types of bacteria in the pictures. So the domain bacteria, this domain consists of mostly unicellular, so one singled cell. They're prokaryotic cells, so they don't have a nucleus. And the bacteria these bacteria, they can pretty much live anywhere. So they can inhabit many diverse environments on the earth. So bacteria, they live on your skin, they live inside your digestive tract, they live on your desk, they're in the air, they're, they're, just, they're everywhere. So there's lots and lots of different types of bacteria, tons and tons of different species. But they all have this common characteristic, they're unicellular prokaryotic organisms. Our second domain, the domain archaea, remember these are also prokaryotic organisms. They're also unicellular, so they're very similar to bacteria, except their habitat is different. So archaea, they live in very extreme environments. So they live in places such as hot springs. So if you've ever been to Yellowstone, you have hot springs. There's probably archaea living in the hot springs. They live in um, methane swamps. They live in deep sea ocean vents. So they live in environments where you don't usually think things can live there, but most likely some type of archaea is gonna live in that extreme environment. Our third domain is the domain eukarya. Remember, domain eukarya has eukaryotic cells. So these cells are bigger, they have a nucleus that holds the DNA, they have organelles. And this domain, as I mentioned, it's split up into four kingdoms. So the first kingdom is the protista kingdom. The protist kingdom includes algae and includes protozoans, which are animal-like organisms. It also includes things like slime molds and water molds. And the pictures I have here, these are more of the algae, the plant-like protists. So the protists there, they can be unicellular, so one cell. They can be multicellular, so more than one cell. And this kingdom includes a wide variety of organisms. And it's actually now being subdivided into seven broad groups based on um, research that's been done on these organisms, so based on their evolutionary relationships. 
And this kingdom is still kind of a mess right now. It's basically anything we don't really know that much about, we kind of throw it into this kingdom. And scientists are currently, like I said, working through it, trying to classify these organisms. The second kingdom in the domain Eukarya is the fungi kingdom. So this includes like the mushrooms you see on the slide. It also includes um, yeast and molds are in this kingdom. These organisms, they can be unicellular, so one cell. They can be multicellular, multiple cells. They usually have a cell wall, so their cells have structure to them. But the important thing is that the fungi cannot do photosynthesis. So they can't make their own food. They actually have to live off of other organisms. And usually the fungi we see, they get their food from decaying organic material. So they get their food from decaying trees or decaying bodies of dead animals, for example. So they have to eat other organisms to get their energy. The third kingdom in the domain Eukarya is the plant kingdom. These organisms, they're multicellular, always multicellular organisms. And then the other characteristic is that they can do photosynthesis, so they carry out photosynthesis. And this, if you remember from the first part of this chapter, photosynthesis, that's where you take carbon dioxide, you take water, you add sunlight to it, it goes through this metabolic reaction, it goes through the photosynthesis, and you end up with glucose and oxygen out of this process. So the plants are really, really important in that energy cycle of the biosphere. The fourth and final kingdom in the domain you carry is the animal kingdom. Animals are also multicellular, so many, many cells make up animals. And they usually have a nervous system so they can get information from their environment. They're also capable of movement or locomotion. Then kind of like the fungi, they also cannot produce their own food. They have to eat other organisms or the products of other organisms in order to live. And the animal kingdom, it includes fish, it includes birds, reptiles, amphibians, the invertebrates like insects, and then also mammals that we see up here. So lots of different types of animals. In taxonomy, so so far we've looked at the three domains, so our bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. We've looked at eukarya and how it's split up into kingdoms. So we have the protists, the fungi, the plants, the animal kingdom under domain eukarya. Under the kingdom, organisms are placed into progressively smaller groups. And these groups include very closely related species in the groups. So in this image, we don't have the domain up at the top, but you see that we have the kingdom, the animal kingdom. Those kingdoms are divided into phylums, phylums divided into classes, classes divided into orders, orders divided into families, families divided into a genus, and then finally you get to one individual species at the bottom right here. So that genus and species, the very last two categories, the smallest ones, we actually use that to create this scientific name or binomial nomenclature up here. So each species has a unique scientific name. And this, the main purpose of a scientific name is that so scientists in different countries, instead of using a common name for an animal, they can use a scientific name. So they're better at communicating with each other, they know exactly what species we're talking about here in America versus if they're doing research on it in Germany as well, for example. So it helps the scientists collaborate with each other, um, 
put their research together. So these scientific names, you, how do you actually create these? So up here we have a clownfish, like Nemo, right here. So Finding Nemo. So these clownfish, their scientific name is Amphiphiron ocerellus. And you can see that in the italics under the clownfish picture. So the scientific name, the first word, the Amphiphiron, that's the genus that this fish belongs to. And the genus is capitalized, so you can see a capital A. The Ocerellus, that is a specific species. And the species name is not capitalized. Then you take that whole scientific name and you italicize it. So that indicates that it's a scientific name and that you're talking about a certain species up here. These evolutionary relationships that we've been looking at and how we place organisms into these different domains and kingdoms and families and orders and all that, how we actually figure out what group to put organisms into is that we look at their genomes and proteonomes. So genomes include all the genes or all the DNA that an organism has. A proteonome includes the proteins that the cells create in that organism. So these genomes and proteomes, they give us a genetic way or a biochemical, so kind of chemistry way, to understand how these organisms are related to each other and how they've evolved or changed through time. So if two organisms have very similar genomes, they have similar DNA, we can say that they're more closely related to each other. Whereas if you have two organisms that have very different genes, very different DNA, we say that they're not as closely related to each other. So like I just said, a genome looks at the complete genetic composition or the DNA of an organism. So if you're looking at a eukaryotic organism, the scientists will go into the nucleus, extract the DNA, and actually sequence the DNA to see what it looks like, what types of genes that organism has. And this is actually called genomics. So we have specific techniques where we can analyze the DNA sequences in these different genomes. And genomics, it goes more um, with computers. So we're building up these databases of different genomes from different organisms. We put them in the internet and then people can download each other's information and use it. The proteonomes, as I mentioned, this is all the proteins that a cell or organism can make. And we'll get into this later, but the DNA, that genetic material in a cell, it tells a cell which proteins it can actually make and what proteins it can't make. So proteonomics, this again is just the techniques that scientists use to analyze the proteonome within a single species. Okay, so for part two of chapter one, kind of the main ideas are the summary. So we looked at evolution, we looked at that unity of life, and that happens in two mechanisms. We talked about vertical descent with mutation and horizontal gene transfer. Then we also looked at that diversity of life, so how Organisms are separated into categories. We can classify them based on how they're related to each other. So we looked at those three domains. We looked at bacteria, archaea, eukarya. Then we also looked at that binomial nomenclature, that scientific naming, and how that occurs with this. So this is part two of three of chapter one.